So I'm going to talk um, about villages for the future, why they're important, and I'll talk um, quite a bit about the particular village that we're developing in Wairua in the Northern Hawke's Bay. And the background to this for a start, and this comes from the holistic management framework of Alan Savory. Is there anyone here that's not familiar with that at all? Okay, most of you. <coughs> so um, I'll speak briefly about Alan Savory. Um, he's written a book called Holistic Management, and basically it, it's talking a little bit about what Dan Palmer was talking about um, earlier on this morning. It's about how we can manage the natural environment, and Alan's particular... Um, to regenerate the environment. And Alan's particular um, field was the regeneration of, of um, the, what do they call them, the, the, like the pasture lands in Africa. Because in, in Africa, a lot of those, um, oh, what are they called? It's not savannas, is it? What is it? Yeah. Savannas? Okay, so the savannah lands in Africa. Um, and a lot of those places, they were gradually going into desert all the time. And he was in the, essentially the, the Rhodesian or the Zimbabwean wildlife um, department. And the, at the time, the current, the, the thinking at the time was that the animals were to blame. And that the, actual, the animals were aggravating the situation and making it worse. So there was a lot of effort put into getting rid of certain animals off those <coughs> savannas. But what he found through his own personal experience was it was actually the way the animals were being managed that was the problem. I mean, it's not too hard to imagine that those savannas evolved over millions of years with herbivores. So why all of a sudden is it a problem? And, and essentially what he found was that <coughs> the way that they had managed in the past was this delicate balance between the herbivores and the predators. So the predators would make sure that those animals keep moving. So they would tend to be graze around a lot of different areas <coughs> and come back every now and again to the other grass. And, and when they grazed, they were usually grazing quite quickly and they would often trash the area. And what it did, it, what evolved was a system whereby the grasses were actually incorporating a lot of carbon into the soil. And it was the grazing and the hoof action of the, um, <coughs> the herbivores that was maintaining the ecology of those savannas. And as soon as they started taking the animals off, it actually deteriorated. <clears throat> so what we're left with is we're still left with the legacy that um, four legs are bad, <laughs> two, two legs are good. The, the animals still have a reputation of being bad in those areas, but what people are continually proving all the time is that if you manage the animals properly, they actually regenerate savannas, they regenerate arid pasture lands. So um, when he worked through how um, to resolve this in his mind, he developed a system called holistic management. And it's really worth looking at his book. And I'm just going to introduce you to one of the processes that he works through. And, and essentially one of the processes that holistic management works through is let's um, see that there are four fundamental ecological processes that we need to respond to and to honour, in a, in, a, in a sense, to respect those four ecological processes. And that's the water cycle, the mineral cycle, energy flows and community dynamics. <coughs> it's really not a lot different than when um, permaculture talks about um, earth care, um, people care, and what's the third fair one? Share. Fair share. <coughs> this fair share is in here. So I'm just going to keep coming back to this every now and again. So one of the images that stuck with me last night with um, Albert Bates was the images of the um, cities that were all down the edge of the river. Did, did everyone hear that last night? The down the Amazon River? Yeah, okay. And what they talked about, and, and you'll see it more in Albert's book, is that those cities extended out as far as the eye could see. But they were horizontal. <coughs> they weren't vertical. So they had a, a fairly sustainable culture there that had been going for thousands of years. And in those thousands of years, they'd built up that topsoil there. And it had become stronger. 
So they were protecting both the water and the mineral cycle. And because they, they were essentially not importing or exporting a lot of things, they, were, they would have understood the energy flows. And because they were all living in one place, that there would have, the community dynamics would have been respected. So that's an example in some ways of, of a, <clears throat> a sustainable and regenerative community. But unfortunately, they had a narrow genetic base, so that was one thing that they had a flaw with. But if we, if we just keep that image in our minds for a little while, what, um, <clears throat> what we've developed over time is a lot of cities. And we've developed a system that is, that is essentially a machine that, that doesn't really respect any of these four processes. And that's why things are breaking down. So if, if we get that, I mean, it's really easy to look at a city and understand that um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's not respecting the mineral cycle. I mean, what we see is that the minerals are being taken from all around the city, brought into the city, and then put into a big pipe and pumped out. So it doesn't respect that mineral cycle at all. Um, in the same way with water. Often water is, is closed out of the system. It's put underground or it's run off really quickly. So one of the things we're faced with is, is uh, what Bill Mollison called a type one error. So it's like an error in design that um, it's inherently won't work. It's inherently bad. So we, in a lot of ways, we're faced with a situation is faced with a situation of our cities inherently a type one era. <clears throat> and where do we draw the line? Like if you look at the the motorways and the high rise buildings, there's no way that you can develop um, an ecology out of those that respects those four processes. If you go and have a look at the if you go through Auckland, you can still see a lot of the old villages that used to be connected up with farmlands and productive gardens, but they're all built over now. But, but the essence of the villages that were Auckland are still there. And there's probably some places in Auckland now where you could actually go back to having that village. Maybe, maybe not. So for me, one of the challenges um, for the permaculture movement is where do we go to set up <clears throat> um, community dwelling places that respect those four dynamics? Can we do it in the city or not? Now, that's a choice I'm not faced with particularly, but I think I just want to throw that challenge out to everyone because some people still want to stick with the cities. And, that, and it is a real challenge. For me, I wasn't brought up in a city, so I've got no desire to go and live in a city. So the village that we're doing is out in the countryside. But one of the things that drives that is knowing that at some level, cities and, and even large towns are inherently unsustainable. <clears throat> and that in terms of how we might address the um, people living on the planet, to a large degree, we actually need to spread out over the environments that are suitable for us to live in and make the best of them. And one of the things that, that I really enjoyed about Albert's talk was him saying that um, don't focus on the lifeboat, even though that's part of the process, or focus on the fact that our, our actual lifeboat is our catchment. And so for me, if I look at the catchment that is the, the valley that, that we're in, I can imagine that our whole community can focus on re regenerating that whole catchment and honouring these processes here. And, th and that, in essence, the whole world is just an, accumulative, uh, an accumulation of, of um, <coughs> catchments, water catchments. So while I'm only going to concentrate on our village, I just wanted to bring up how we need to address um, whether, whether cities are at all sustainable at, at all. Because the way we've got by in the last couple of hundred years is that we've tended to ignore all these things and we've been able to do all sorts of things because we've had unlimited fossil fuels and we've had unlimited resources and because in essence we've been part of the empire and all empires 
and cities are, are part of that process, bring resources <coughs> from the periphery into the centre. <coughs> and that's what's, what's been happening all over the world. And we've been part of the, the British Empire, and that's built up a lot of strength and, and um, capital assets within our communities that have been at the expense of those people that, that the British Empire um, used over that time. And now that empire role has gone over to the USA, even though Europe and, and uh, the UK are still sort of an empire mode, um, it's now the US that's in that strongest mode. But, but um, apart from the politics of seeing what's happened, we need to understand the ecology of what's happened. Because if we go back to the Roman Empire, it did the same thing. It overran the resources. So cities and empires tend to go together. They, they're part of that process where we bring resources and other people's assets um, into the centre and, and build them up. And usually what happens, they become unsustainable. Or we end up pumping so many resources out of our um, host colonies that we collapse them and then they're no longer any use to us. So for me the challenge sits within a larger context of being part of a colonial empire for several hundred years. Where do we go? And, and for me personally, I think, I believe that um, cities are unsustainable and we actually have to see that our communities will be um, thousands of villages. <coughs> And that's what it used to be like in a lot of ways. If we go back several hundred years before the Industrial Re Revolution, there were, uh, there were um, thousands of villages. And, and by and large, they, they were relatively sustainable. But we don't have the experience of those. But now what we have the experience is, is we're slowly getting into the collapse of the old empire. So it's like, where do we go from here? And for me, um, the challenge sits with the permaculture movement, for me, it says, where do we invest our time and our energy and the money that we have now? And how do we best do that? So that's my take on villages. So that sets the context. Um, and I was, I mean, it was, the, the uh, image I had that came from out of Albert's book was the fact that those the old way of doing things was horizontal and um, would have been a lot more democratic. There wouldn't have been so much um, elitism in it. And as soon as you start seeing people going vertical, it usually means that there's some sort of elitist movement happening. And the, one of the best examples is, is Easter Island. It's like as they depleted their resources and within their own island they sort of had this little empire building they put their energy into building up or sort of monuments to themselves rather than being integrated into that ecology. And they collapsed the whole ecology of Easter Island. Yeah, and they had slavery. So, um, so that for me, that's the context in which, which I say and which I'm involved in, in saying, um, let's create villages. So as well as creating our own village, um, I'm here to just to connect with other people who might be thinking along similar lines and how they might. And, and I could just as easily imagine revillaging large parts of Auckland as in a rural area. So it's not, not just about rural areas, but I happen to believe that our best opportunities at the moment are in rural areas. So, so one issue is, yeah, okay, uh, uh, cities, type one era. Another issue for me is private ownership of land, a type one era. Now, it's hard for us to think about that because we've been used to private ownership of land for a long time now. But if we go back two or three hundred years or some, a bit more for some people, there wasn't a lot of private ownership of land, but there was a commons. And most of us had access to it. But, but the industrial system has encouraged those um, people who are good at making money or good at making products to have ownership of land. So the whole ownership of land thing 
has been part of a deliberate strategy to encourage um, that mode of culture. So we're used to that, and especially for those who've been brought up over the last 40, 50 years, we're used to being, there being capital gain and land. And if you, if you heard a little bit from Nicole Foss, we know that we're probably going to pay the price for that capital gain because it's a whole lot of debt that's been building up. <clears throat> so for me, um, I spent, I've spent the last probably 30 years being involved in communities, both ones that I was getting going myself and observing a lot of other ones around. And I've come to the point where I firmly believe that, that private ownership of land is a type one era and in particular having the um, value of that land tied to the banks which, at the market, which is what it, what's happened now. Um, in particular, the last eco-village that I developed, what I saw was that the tying the, the capital value of the land ended up forcing the price up um, in relationship like a hot lot faster than the um, increase in... Uh, inflation. So that value that was being created essentially by the ability of the banks to, to lend money to you and for you to go into debt made it harder for people to come in and buy those blocks of land. It made it harder for young people to come in. It made it harder for the community to invest in its own development. So the banks essentially acting as an agent for transferring value out of communities to cities. Richard Duthwaite did a study on the banking system in, in Ireland and the conclusion he came to was the banks in those rural places were simply a conduit of sending money and value out of those communities and into the city. There was a lot more money going out than, than what there was coming back in. Um, when we looked around about, looked about and said, okay, what other systems are going to be better because this is something we've grown up with all our life is, is the idea that you have private ownership and, and you have capital gain and land. Um, we went through the same um, journey as a group of islanders on the, on the west coast of Scotland. And there's a community land trust there that's uh, on the Isle of Egg. And there was probably about 30, 40 villages living on that island and, and a lot of the land in Scotland is a feudal system was owned by a German uh, industrialist, or I'm not sure exactly what his job was, but um, he had a, a, a split up with his wife. The villagers came home one night and there were eviction notices on their doors. Um, Sorry guys, you're going to have to leave, I'm going to sell the island. So they sort of said, well hold on, this is our island, you know, they, they'd sort of lived there for generations. Um, we don't want to go. So they did a quick search as to how can we own this land? We want to buy it. Um, and they came up with, uh, at the time, mainly American model of the Community Land Trust. The Community Land Trusts come from the, the tradition of recognising that at one stage we all had commons and there was value in the community having control of the land around them. And so in the, I think it was in the 1940s or so, um, it might have been in the 1960s, they set up the first community land trusts in America. And the main characteristics of a community land trust is that they're owned by a, by a trust, essentially a non-profit trust. Um, people have tenure, so that could be long term, um, but it's guaranteed by the trust, so they don't own the land, but they have private ownership of the tenure. Um, the other characteristic of the community land trust is that you buy in at a certain value, and when you sell, you sell at the same value plus any inflation. Or in times to come, it might be deflation. <clears throat> so there was no capital gain involved in... Uh, the ownership of that land. And what those, those main characteristics, what they tend to do is they stop speculation and they encourage investment in community. So in the Isle of Egg, since they bought the land, 
they went into um, a partnership with the, the Scottish equivalent of DOC and with the government and the people um, put in what money they had. They, they bought the land, they put it into a community land trust and since that time they've developed um, the port so like the, the infrastructure of the port was breaking down so they fixed that up. <coughs> They've um, developed a, a metal quarry. They put in several wind turbines, so they're producing their own power. They put in a dairy farm. Um, they've invested in a whole lot of things. And the people, they're not run on a communal basis. They're run on essentially private enterprise, but the owners of the assets are the trust. And since that time, they've got 70 families living on that island now compared with the 30 or 40 that they had and they've got a waiting list for people to go onto that island. And, and now there's, um, the Scottish government has essentially said to a lot of other communities, if you guys want to buy out the present owners, we'll support you to do that. So they recognised that that pattern of ownership was able to develop the community. And we're in the same situation here. Like for me, as a farmer, I watched our community, um, which was about four families and I could hear um, <coughs> the, the, um, the farmers swear at their dogs, you know, and I knew all the language that they used, so they were pretty close. Um, and now there's not one farm in that valley. And that, that valley supported four families. That, there, was always, there was lots of kids. Everyone grew um, all their own vegetables. Um, we were pretty self-sufficient in food and there was a strong sort of uh, community socially. And so in my lifetime, that's totally disappeared. And it's mainly about the land tenure system and the fact that the land tenure system is captured by corporate um, <coughs> values. <coughs> so if we want to talk about these values, <coughs> we actually have to uncapture the land from corporate values. We actually have to find a way of protecting it. And, and one of the main things that we've learned is that it's not enough just to put it into a trust. We actually have to peg the capital value. As long as we let the capital value float, we're essentially we're doing free trade. We're doing free trade with the bankers. And, and free trade usually means those people who have got the most strength win. So the farmers, all the farming communities have slowly been stripped in this country and it's the same in America and it's the same in Australia. So the actual land tenure and our ability to invest in community development is a major part of the problem that we have. And a large part of what we need to do is, is re-establish villages. And I talked to one of our um, apprentices where they still have a village um, culture and that's in Turkey and they have really strong villages and the farmers go out to their farms they walk out to them and that's slowly disappearing there too for the same reason so the challenge for us is um, if we recognize those patterns that happen because of land tenure and because of financial systems that encourage farmers to get into debt um, we need to come up with an alternative. So for us, the Community Land Trust was a really clear alternative. We've spent the last year translating it from an American legal perspective, which is the French legal system, into the English legal system, which is a little bit different. So what I'm going to go through is um, just a schematic diagram of the legal structures and some of the social structures that were set up in terms of trying to come to terms with what's required to develop a village. Okay, so um, Okay, so our initial starting point is we started up a private company. So that's essentially a development company. <coughs> We've got three levels of governance. Um,
So one is the Community Land Trust. And that is mainly about um, ownership of the land. Can't see any of that green board. Can't see that. Oh, really? So that's mainly about ownership of the land, and it's about um, directing development, and it's about securing tenure and that's a charitable tr it's a trust in this case it's a charitable trust in America they're not for profit trusts um, another part of the governance is uh, um, is what we call okay so that's the the village incorporated society So that's mainly about membership, and it's about managing commons. And it's about um, relationships. And the other significant part of the governance is um, essentially individual leases. The house side allotments. So we recognise the pattern that people need their own space and these are going to be clustered into um, but yeah, there'll be probably eight to 12 houses clustered, and then there'll be another cluster, and then another cluster. We're looking at about 30 families or so at the moment. Um, those are the three main governance systems that we have. Yeah. Why did you feel it necessary to have a trust and an incorporated society? Because they're different roles. Yeah, you could have had two. Um, for me, it comes out of my experience. I've, dealing with this stuff. Um, for me, this, is, this fills the role of the elders and a wisdom. So it's actually about, this is actually about protecting the land and protecting people's tenure. This is about managing relationships. We could, we could, have, we could have both of them in, but they're two quite different things. And we actually, we actually haven't got a lot of experience in either of these things. And what tends to happen is here, if there's, if there's any um, fighting going to go on, that's where it'll happen. So if, that, if, if you've got a, um, disputes going on in here, you don't want it mixed up with this. Okay? Yeah. Okay, I'm just, I'm just getting there, okay? So the other thing that we have, which is really not governance, but as well as that, um, people can have land use tenure or contracts. Okay, so in terms of the relationships, the role of the company is to set the whole thing up. <clears throat> Wood End Ventures Limited. That's the company. So it was just the name of the farm. It was Wood End. Is, is it incorporated? It's incorporated. It's a, it's a private company. It's got three directors. And basically what they've said to anyone who wants to get involved, we're going to hold the role of the development company for two years. And in that time, we're going to put these structures together and we're going to sell leases to pay for the land. And then once the land's paid for, we're going to get out of the way. So the company has a, a, um, a memorandum of intent that, that it's signed, and it goes in front of these people here. This actually doesn't really get underway until the company gets out of the way. So these, 
These fulfill the same role until the land's paid for. And, and uh, yeah. So we're at the stage at the moment where we've got all that legal structure together. We've got some people that have paid for leases, but we still haven't paid for the land. So we're still sitting, the company holds the debt on the land at the moment. And its job is to get rid of that debt by selling leases. So it's selling, it's selling leases um, that uh, these... The leases are from the trust. <clears throat> In the future, at the moment, the company fulfills that role, so they're with the company at the moment until the company gets out of the way. Does the company then dissolve? Yep. Oh, no, it'll probably go on and do another village. <laughs> yeah, so it's just a, it's a property developer. And one of the other one of the other things that it's set up is a, a cooperative. So this will be similar to a Monde Grand cooperative. And basically the company will be saying, okay, in the process of setting up the village, we're going to have to put in roads, we got, we'll be developing fencing, we're going to be doing some buildings. Blah, blah, blah. We're like, we've got a list of things that we want to develop and we've got the money to do it once we've sold enough leases. And so we'll contract the cooperative to do that work. That cooperative will build up its own momentum and at some point it'll just become part of the village. And we anticipate that it'll go on from working for the company to working for individuals in terms of building houses or whatever other things it chooses to do. So, um, yeah, the company's setting up all the structures. Are you going to talk about the, where the money goes? Like how much? Yeah, so at the moment, um, when people buy a lease, it costs them, there's a discounted price at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so it costs them 80 grand. Normally it costs 100 grand. How long was the lease? The lease, this is, this is um, an interesting one. Because we're in a council where we can have as many houses on our land as we like. They've got no limit. And if we, if we have leases over 34 years, we need to do subdivide and go through the resource consent process. So we've decided that the leases are 34 years and we're trusting that, that the trust will roll them over. Now the trust has five trustees. There are two from here, one from here, one from the Kuang Institute, so that's four, and then those four people to get together and they choose a fifth one. So they co-opt someone who's going to create more balance in the, in the role of trustee. So it, it, it does look a bit complicated. <laughs> well, I think it's worthwhile talking more about why you've got the three, three legs of the trustees. Oh, okay. One of the, um, all the time when we're doing permaculture design, it's good to say, okay, what are the patterns of old systems that work? Or what are the patterns that we see people have created in similar situations? And there's usually good reason for them. So one of the patterns within the community land trust movement is called tripartite governance, which is basically three parts. So the American systems are mainly set up for low-cost housing. So one of the um, stakeholders in, in that low-cost housing is going to be the, um, the tenants themselves. Another one of the stakeholders is often the developer, and another stakeholder is the community around it. So in America, they've set up a tripartite governance system for their um, community land trusts. And what that does is it, it, when you put people in that situation and you give them a co-papa to hold and say, okay, you're there to hold this in trust, it, it tends to take away a lot of the human dynamics that might happen in this group. And they're actually empowered to look after certain things in the trust. 
and, and you actually don't want the tenants to be completely dominant in that situation because they have their own concerns and then some of them are about just themselves and, and, and sometimes they'll be about other things as well. But one of the things we actually have to look after is the land itself and the relationships of non-humans on that land. And there's, also, there's a whole lot of other things that, that are associated with the land. It's not just about the people who have got leases, which is this organisation is about people who have leases or people that have been given membership for one reason or another. But this is a different role. So that's why we've got um, trustees are split between... So I guess our hope is that that, um, that holds a bit of balance. The cooperative has obviously got a role because it's got to look after the jobs that it's creating within the community. Um, the, the ordinary members have a role because they're tenants and they need secure tenure and they're just they're part of the village like everyone else. Um, the Konga Institute has been has been given a specific position within the village and a specific role. So I mean we felt like it was a good idea to give them one member of, of the trusteeship. And there's always been that idea that you co-op to get to hold the balance in the larger group. So we might look outside the community and say that person represents the Wairau community, we'd really like them to be part and bring their perspective into the trusteeship. So we've tried to look around at what, at what patterns are going to be useful for us. And probably one of the main things that, that I've been um, really strong on is to avoid consensus decision making. So for me, my take, I mean, I've had a lot to do with consensus decision making. Even in situations where it legally wasn't required, we often go there by default because that's the, that's the feeling at the moment that people want to do that sort of thing. And for me personally, I've never seen anything good come out of it, particularly. So that's quite a strong statement, but, but, but I, I'm really clear on that one. Most of my experience is consensus doesn't work. What it creates often is a no decision mode and, and a lowest common denominator mode. And so for me, I think it's really important that we come to terms with the leadership. Yes, we want consensus, but consensus is a noun. It's not an adjective. So we actually don't get to consensus by consensus decision making. We get to consensus by relationship. And that usually involves being in relationship within the whole community for generations. That's where we've got consensus. I mean, I, I can look, we've lived quite a bit of time in Maori communities on the East Cape, and, and they often see themselves as being in consensus, but you could equally see them as being totally dictatorship. But they do have a consensus, and that's, been, that's evolved for them over many generations. They definitely have a consensus, but they don't do it by consensus decision making. And those people who hold a role of leadership in those communities are accountable and, and they still have to work through the process of coming to a consensus. And what Martin Luther King said was that consensus is not about seeking, um, I mean, leadership is not about seeking consensus. Uh, leadership is about moulding consensus. So for me, that's one of the challenges that sits with us. Because we've come from a situation where we've rejected a lot of authoritarian and hierarchical and leadership positions, a lot of us tend to go by default to consensus. And for me, I don't think it's a good path. So other people can try it, I don't have any problem with that, but for us, we've said we don't want to go down that track. So those people come on board, that's one of the values that we hold. And if they don't like it, they go and set up their own consensus decision-making project somewhere else. Is, 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 uh, is it three out of five heads with regard to your five trustees? Um, that's majority decisions, yeah. Yeah, it's majority decisions. <coughs> um, same thing within this, we have a leadership model, and that most incorporated societies um, form a committee, and the committee makes the decision. The incorporated society can always pull the whole committee together and sack them. They can pull them in and have a special general meeting and make a decision as a group, but the committee makes the decision, so it's a leadership model. It's not a consensus model. But 
I mean, we're still wanting to aim for consensus. So both the committee and the trust are charged with consulting and with developing consensus within the whole village. So we actually have to grow a new culture. And, and so for me, the idea of consensus decision making is coming out of our heads. And it doesn't den deny the idea for need for consensus, but we just don't get it by consensus decision making. Can, can I just, um, just, just put another point of view that it does work, and it's so you know, it was, it's based on consensus decision making, and I think there are different models of consensus, yeah. and I do agree that, that, that the relationship between leadership and consensus of a group is, is you know, there's a tension there, which, yep. which we're only beginning to kind of tease yeah. out. Really. And that's what we've got to explore. And, and we, if we don't have the balance of the two, then we'll get lost. Yeah. I just add that I think it, um, a predetermining factor is the consciousness of the group itself. Yep, yeah. it is, totally, yeah. So um, all these, these models here are open to change. So the registered objectives of this are pretty straightforward, but the kaupapa that we hold in a schedule next to it can change. So these trustees all come from the community and they're charged with a certain role, but we can change the way this operates. So if we, I mean, if we really want to, that could go into consensus mode if it really wanted to. I mean, it probably, it probably wouldn't happen on my watch, but it might. <laughs> same, same with this here. This is set up on a, on a traditional incorporated society, just like your bowling club. And, and we could change that. Like at the moment, one of the things I've been looking at is sociocracy. And then I'm looking, reading about this, and then someone comes up with this other horrible term, which is called holacracy. But for me, it actually seems that, that resonated with me straight away when I saw it. It's because it's saying we're not just looking after the interests of the people, we're actually looking after the interests of the whole. So all these things can change. The role of the company was to say we actually need to get from where we are now to somewhere else. And it's not going to be perfect, it needs to evolve, but we need to get out of where we're in and go somewhere else. And it's mainly about, if we can't honour those four processes and set up systems that honour those four processes, then we're going to keep going down the same track we are. Yeah? Where did you get the money? Um, I begged and borrowed it. Where, where it came from was the mana of the Kohang Institute. So what happened was we were sitting in the um, Bay of Plenty and we, we left Kaiwaka where we were, which was my family farm. We decided that we needed to move from there and we went walkabout for a while. We went walkabout for four years. We were sitting up there and a woman rang us up and she said, I really love the work you're doing. Um, I want to come and help you, find a way of helping. So she flew up spent some time with us. We went down and had a look at her land down there on the farm. We decided we didn't want to shift there, but um, her husband owned uh, an investment company in London, and he's investing in forestry companies all up the east coast of New Zealand. So we said to them, you buy um, some forestry land, which has got some good land on it, we want to buy it off you. And they lent us all the money to do it. Because we'd already identified that it's really hard to and, and, and two weeks ago, I had an, um, a phone call from a woman in, in uh, Wellington, and she said, I'm willing to lend you $600,000. And one of the main reasons why I'm going to I'm want to lend it to you is because you're not into consensus decision making. Personal question, but I think it's relevant because you're being emphatic about a leadership model. Yep. Um, what was your reason for leaving Kauanga, given it's quite a well-established community? Um, there were several reasons. One. Was it leaving Kauanga? It was leaving Kohati Le Eco Village. So yeah, we've still we've taken that business with us, that charitable trust. Um, there were several reasons. One was that the land was confined by the state highway, so there was a limited number of sites that co could go on it. By developing it the way we did, all we were left with was um, the house sites and not enough money to develop it further. Okay, So it's like, at the moment, it's stuck in a situation where it's got no money to develop that farm. And that wasn't a situation that I envisaged would happen, but that's what it seems to have happened. 
and the same situation happened in another eco village not too far away. It's common over district planning. Um, no, what what it is is that you have to consciously choose to invest in something other than subdividing your land. Okay. So. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Odomatea, so um, there's one member here, so he'll tell me if I'm lying or anything. <laughs> but basically, in, um, in Odomatea Eco Village, they actually had enough money left over after they'd done the development to invest in things. And they couldn't agree on what to invest in, so it all went back. Okay? So that wasn't, we had the situation where we didn't even have enough money. But even if we had, we probably would never have agreed what to do with it either. Okay? So um, that's the thing around leadership often. So as soon as you get everyone equal say on what's going to happen with the money, it's bloody hard to, to actually come to an agreement. One of the really beautiful things for me was going into a Muslim country recently, and one of the guys said to me, in the Muslim culture, if there's three people get together, the first thing they do is choose a leader. So they understood the patterns that it's bloody hard to work with a partnership of three people. It's hard enough with a partnership of two. <laughs> Especially if one's a man and one's a woman. But as soon as you get to three, you choose a leader. And if you want to go to five and run a partnership, good luck to you. Yeah. I'd just like to hear a bit more about your leadership model. Uh, I mean, basically this one here is just a straight normal company. So I, we have three directors. I'm the managing director. I put everything in front of the directors and say, this is what I want to do. If they support me, fine. If they don't, then I've got a choice of, of either doing something I don't like or resigning. And they appoint someone else. Okay, so that's just a straight hierarchical structure. So my job is to set this up. I've got two years to do it. I've got to get out there and find the money. I've got to get out there and find the people. So in essence, I've been given that role for two years. Okay. Once that, once that role's over, then these guys in here need to pick up their roles and form their own leadership structures. So I've set, the company set in place some leadership structures to get them started, but they can change them. How many on the village? Um, we actually haven't set this up yet. That'll be set, probably be set up in the next few weeks. Um, I'd imagine there's going to be a minimum of five on it but there could be more. Usually most committees are either five or seven. Okay, yeah? With your leases, um, are they registered leases to the extent that people can borrow from the bank to do mortgage on those registered leases, or is that not permitted? Um, you, can, you can register the lease. Um, uh, if someone wants to lend you money, but you couldn't have a mortgage on it, no. Like the trust is essentially... Once the trust is set up, it, it can't have a mortgage on the land. So that's the way you protect yourself against yeah. thieves, is if you just don't yeah. So if these people here are leasing from the trust and they want to borrow from someone for that reason, then it's the lender that takes the risk. Can I just add to that? The only um, institution I know of in this country that will actually do mortgage on leases is credit unions. If you had money into some kind, no bank will mortgage on leasehold land. Yeah. So one of the main roles, one of the main roles of this community land trust here is to manage the finance within that whole group of people. And more than likely, if we have an alternative currency, that'll sit in the cooperative. But, but one of the roles of the community land trust will be decide, as money comes in from these, from these leases, at some point we've got to say, okay, have we got enough or do we actually want to create a bit more money and use that to develop so it can lend? When it comes to household allotments and the actual people who are making up the community, do you set out with an intention to find people that are going to make a community in, in the things from the land trust to the Um, there's a bit of both, but essentially what we see is like and one of our main goals is, is to become self-reliant as a community. So we want to grow all our own food, we want to produce all our own energy, blah, blah, blah. At the same time, we're also acknowledging that we're probably going to need some cash flow and stuff from the outside for quite a while while we develop. 
And in, in, in essence, the company at the moment is saying, because we're choosing the people that come in, so in essence, we're, we're needing to say, okay, what is likely to be um, create more business in this community over the next five or 10 years? And at the moment, the things that, are, that really stand out are things like education, because we already have the Kong Institute nested within it, and we're already doing a lot of education. Um, we've got a really strong focus on growing nutrient-dense food, so um, selling healthy food is a possibility, or selling the services around health care is another. Do you sell that as a package, like this is the intention of this village? If you're coming along, you have to, you know... Not, in a really, well, just in a broad sense. Yeah, in a broad <laughs> sense we do, but not, not specifically. So as these people come in, one of the roles of either the company or the community land trust will be to say, okay, how do we develop the economy of this village within the kaupapa that we already have? So for me, one of the main things that was missing in most of the eco-villages is, is not an em enough emphasis on how we develop the economy. And that's, uh, that's sort of been recognised all over the world. That, I mean, and there's some eco-villages that really focus on the, e the economy. Yeah. Um, there'll be... You, you, let's say you need $5,000 each year yep. to maintain the road. Where yep. is that, which, which source is that coming from and handled by? There's, two, there's several sources of income, so there'll be some from the individual leases, and so part of that will be to, to maintain water supplies and you know, electricity supplies and roads that go to, the, to their house sites. That's, That's, like right. That's like an internal rate. Okay. There's also money that... Um, comes from the lease of the rest of the land and there'll be money probably come from the cooperative that, that it will be leasing some land. I don't mean where does it come from, but who's actually holding it and dealing it? Okay. And levying the internal rate and that sort of thing. This, this levies it. It owns the land. It, it levies the rates. If it's on um, common land, this manages it. So that's, that's the village management system. So the money would go from there to there. Yeah. And then also there might be some things that are more to do with um, the exclusive use land, which is outside of the common land. And then more than likely the trust would turn around and say to the cooperative, um, you manage it. 